grade 11s welcome back to another video with me miss martins in today's video we're going to be looking at electromagnetic induction faraday's law all things related to this topic and we're going to be doing a past paper question as you can see behind me this is some of the questions there's more to come you don't want to miss any part of this video please subscribe if you haven't yet i do math physics chemistry all the videos exam practice you name it i do it let's jump right in the first question is a definition state faraday's law of electromagnetic induction in words and grade 11s as you should know definitions are important they're the easy questions in your physics and chemistry exams you need to learn them off by heart give the definition get two marks so there is my definition the magnitude of the induced emf across the ends of the conductor is directly proportional to the rate of change in the magnetic flux linked within the conductor the next question wants me to write down the polarity so north pole or south pole established so created at point t t is over here as the bar magnet approaches the solenoid now remember the bar magnet is being moved into the solenoid what will happen is because there's relative movement between the bar magnet and the coil so between the conducting wire and the bar magnet, a current will be created in the coil. Remember, an EMF will be induced, a current will be created in the coil. And the current will create its own magnetic field associated with the coil. And the magnetic field created or induced by the current will oppose the magnetic field of the bar magnet. So what happens is we're pushing this bar magnet in to the solenoid. So what is going to happen is the magnetic field that be, that is created the magne magnetic field that is induced will want to get rid of the bar magnet coming into the solenoid it wants to do the opposite so if we're pushing a bar magnet in how do we get rid of the bar magnet we need to push it out and how are we going to push the bar magnet out if we have another north pole okay so what i mean is if a north pole is created at this end of the solenoid over here let's use red to show you if a north pole is created at this end over here of the solenoid north and north repel and this red north pole will repel this bar magnet because we're pushing the bar magnet in this created magnetic field this created north pole will get rid of the bar magnet which is what we want so we want to do the opposite of what the bar magnet is doing. Bar magnet is going in, we want to get it out. So we create a north there. If a north is created on this side, it means on the other side, a south will be created. There we go, south pole. If you need more explanation about that that I just went through, I will link the video down below where I go over this. It's called Lenz's Law. Please go watch that video if you need more practice on how to figure out if this will be north or south or so on. 9.1.3 says what will be observed on the galvanometer so this is the galvanometer it basically detects if there will be a induced emf so a voltage and therefore an induced current okay so what will the galvanometer tell me when the bar magnet is held stationary inside the solenoid so what will be observed on the galvanometer so you can give me any of these as answers you can say that there'll be no reading there'll be zero reading, there'll be no deflection, because deflection means like if it's a needle. So the galvanometer won't move, the needle won't move, it'll be zero, no deflection, no change in magnetic flux linkage. So this, no change in magnetic flux linkage is your reason. When we hold the bar magnet stationary inside the coil, there's no relative motion or no relative movement between the magnet and the conducting wire so they don't move relative to one another one of them needs to move in order there in order for there to be a change in magnetic flux and that is what creates the emf that's what creates the currents 9.1.4 what is the direction of the induced current through the galvanometer choose from x to y or from y to x so let's take a look at that diagram again there's x there's y so we want to know if the current is going from x to y so is the current going that way or is the current going from y to x so is the current going that way and remember we said a north pole will be created over there and on this side will be the south pole so 
So how do I figure out which way the current is going? That is where you use your right hand rule. So how it works is you use your right hand. Okay, so here's my right hand. And you, you point your thumb towards the north. The direction that your fingers are curling in, that is the direction of the current. So take a look. Do you see how my thumb is pointing towards the north? And look at how my fingers are curling. Now what this means, I'm going to leave it here so we can see it. Let's leave it here for a second. What is happening here is it's telling me that my current is going this way. So it's going up the front like this, and it's going down around the back. So it's going up the front, down around the back, up the front, down around the back. So imagine this is down the back. It's going up the front. Look at how the fingers are curling. Up the front, down around the back. So the current's going up, down, and then it's coming this way. And then it's going from Y to X. Then as it goes past X, it's going up the front, down the back, up the front, down the back. I hope you can see it. It, it takes a little bit of like visualizing it and thinking outside the box, but I hope that my right hand here is helping you. So let's move on to the calculations part of this question, starting with 9.2. We have a magnetic field with a field string of 0.5 T, that's 0.5 Tesla, passes through a conducting loop of area 10 centimeters squared, so they give me the area, in such a way that the field lines are at a 70 degree plane, a 70 degree angle to the plane of the loop. Okay, cool. They're giving me a lot of variables. First question, calculate the magnetic flux linkage. Now, magnetics, magnetic flux linkage is the symbol over here. I hope you can recall. So let's take a look at our formula sheets. These are the two formulas given on the formula sheet for the section. This formula is used to calculate magnetic flux or magnetic flux linkage. So this is the formula that I'll be using in 9.2.1. This formula over here is to calculate the induced EMF. Cool. So. 9.2.1, calculate the magnetic flux linkage. Here's the formula. This is magnetic flux or magnetic flux linkage. It's measured in Weber, WB. The B that we use is magnetic flux density. It's basically the field lines. It's basically the strength of the magnetic field. And it's measured in Tesla. That was given to us in the question. Then we have A, which is area. However, in this formula, area must be measured in meters squared. It was given to us in centimeters squared. And then we got theta, which is the angle between B, so between the magnetic field lines, and the normal of the loop. If you need more information about theta, how to find theta, what theta is, what the normal is, I'll link my video on that in the description box below. But let's see what variables I have in order to substitute in this formula. And remember, we're going to have to calculate area. So let me first show you how to convert area. So here are my units. Now, when I was in school, I learned a little rhyme that helped me remember the order. Doesn't matter what rhyme you use. You don't have to use my one, but I used King Henry died of mighty disease called measles. Or King Henry died from a mighty disease called measles. Something like that. Basically, KHD, MD, CM. However you remember that order. And they each stand for units of measurement. So K means kilometers in this case. Kilometers, kilometers. H is hectometers, D is decameters, we don't really use these two, M is meters, D is decimeters, C is centimeters, and M is millimeters. Now, when you convert the units of measurement, every bunny hop, so for example, if I'm going from centimeters to millimeters, every little hop is 10. So if I'm going from centimeters to millimeters, I times 10. But if I go the other way, if I go from millimeters to centimeters, I divide by 10. So in my question, I have got my unit of measurement here being cubic, so, sorry, squared centimeters. And I need to convert that to meters. So how do I go from centimeters to meters? Here's centimeters, here's meters. I need to do one, two bunny hops to the left. So remember, one bunny hop is divided by 10. So two bunny hops to the left will be divided by 100. Okay, and it makes sense. There's 100 centimeters in one meter. However, if I'm converting centimeters squared 
two meters squared, you can't divide by 100. So let me just write it here for you. If you're going from centimeters, let's write it over here. If you're going from centimeters to meters, you divide by 100, like I showed you here. One, two, divide by 100. However, if you're going from centimeters squared, like I have in the question, to meters squared, you must divide by 100 squared. Okay, because we're dealing with area. So therefore, the area is not 10 centimeters squared. You must divide it by 100 squared. It's going to end up being 0, 0,001 meters squared. Now remember, if you're dividing by 100 squared, you're basically dividing by this number. 100 squared will have four zeros in it. One, two, three, four. So you're basically dividing by 10,000. So 10 divided by 10,000 gets me 0, 0,001 meters squared. Right, that is what I'm going to put into my formula. So how you would do this is you write your formula first, which I have over here. Now, obviously, you will rewrite it on your answer page. This is my formula there. So you get a mark for your formula. Then you substitute. So B is given to you in the question at 0, 0,5. Your area is 0, 0,001. And now theta. This over here is a little bit tricky to figure out. So remember, theta, as I wrote over here, is the angle between B, which is your magnetic field lines, and the normal. Now remember, what we mean by the normal is if I have a loop that looks like this, pretend it's a circular loop that looks like this, the normal is a invisible 90 degree line to the loop, like that. If I have a loop that looks like this, the normal is again an invisible 90 degree line that looks like that. So if this is my loop, let's pretend this is my loop, okay? And the field lines can go through. Okay, let's, let's use my hand like this. Here's my loop. It's a circle, okay? I hope you can see it. It's a circle. The magnetic field lines could go through it like this. The normal would be a 90 degree line that goes up like that. So when they say in this question that the magnetic field lines are passing in such a way that they are at 70 degrees to the plane of the loop, what they mean is actually something that looks like this. Here's the loop. Okay, it's a circle like that. There's the normal, which is a 90 degree line like that, a perpendicular line. And when they say that the magnetic field lines are at a 70 degree to the plane of the loop, what they mean is this is the plane. So your field lines, if they come in at 90 degrees relative to the plane, they would come in like this. Okay, and your angle would be zero. Because if your normal is like this and your field lines are coming in like this, then they're going in the same direction. There's no angle between them. So the angle would be zero. However, in this case, the normal is still like this, but the field lines are coming in like this at 70 degrees. So let me draw you a picture. So here, as you can see, here's my loop. It's a circular loop. Imagine it like that. Here's the 90 degree. This is the plane of the loop, basically. And the field lines are coming in at a 70 degree. So if the field lines, if the magnetic field lines had to come in at a 90 degree angle, they would look like this. They would come in like this. And then the field lines and the normal would be the same and the angle would be zero. However, that's not what's happening here. The field lines are coming in not at 90 degrees. They're coming in at 70 degrees. So what that means is this angle here is 70 degrees. I hope that makes sense. The angle from the plane of the loop to the magnetic field line. So imagine this is a field line here. That angle is 70. However, theta is not that angle. Theta is not 70. Theta is the angle between the field line. So between this line over here, this is the field line that's entering here, and the normal. So theta is technically this angle over here. So if this is 70, this one over here, what is theta? What is this angle over here? This angle would be 20. I hope you know why, because if let's draw it take me out the way put me there if my normal is like this and the field lines are coming in like this at an angle of 70 degrees to the plane of the loop here's the loop that's the plane of the loop so 70 degrees then the sum of these two angles okay they're adjacent complementary 
adding them together would give me 90. So if this is 70, this one must be 20. So in your formula, theta will be 20. So when I sub in, calculate it, I get 4.7 times 10 to the negative 4 Weber. And this is where you would get your marks. Our next question says, calculate the average EMF that will be induced across the ends of the coil if it is removed from the field in 0.2 seconds. So now we are going to use this formula. EMF is equal to negative N delta, the symbol over here, magnetic flux, divided by time. So just a quick recap on what all the symbols mean. Remember, N is number of turns. This symbol is change in magnetic flux. So you need your final minus your initial. Let's discuss and sub in each of the variables. So N is number of turns. And in this case, my N is one. We've just got one coil, okay? If it's a solenoid, so if it's something that is wrapped around and around and around and around, then your N would increase. But because this is just one loop, it's one coil, my N is one. But remember the negative is there. So we've got negative one. Then my change in magnetic flux, I'm going to work out over here. So I'm going to say, okay, cool. It is final minus initial. So now my final magnetic flux would be zero because we are removing the coil. Okay, we're removing the field. We're removing the coil from the field, basically. So final is going to be zero. Then minus my initial will be what I calculated in 9.2.1. And I can use a rounded off answer because it's a new question. So you may use the rounded off version of the answer. So it's your final, which is zero, because you have removed the magnetic field from the quill, or vice versa, minus your initial, and then you divide it by the time, and the time is given to you. And remember, EMF is measured in volts, so your answer will be in volts. 9.3 says a circular quill is placed inside a magnetic field and rotated clockwise to induce an EMF. So there's relative motion between the coil and the field. That's good. That means an EMF will be induced. How will the following changes influence the magnitude of the induced EMF? So magnitude means the size of the induced EMF, not the direction of the current or anything like that, the size of the EMF. Choose from increase, decrease remains the same. So if I change the polarity of the magnet, so let's pretend I have a north pole here and a south pole here, and I place the coil within the mag that magnetic field. And then I change it and I say, okay, I'm going to change it up and I'm going to put the north here and the south here. What would that do to the magnitude of the induced EMF? Nothing. It would remain the same. And just for interest sake, why would it remain the same? If I change the poles of the magnets, I'm not changing anything in the formula over here that helps me calculate EMF. I'm not changing time. I'm not changing number of turns. I'm not changing the, the magnetic strength. If you switch the poles, it doesn't change the magnetic strength. I'm not changing area, I'm not changing the angle, so it remains the same. But what happens if I increase the speed of rotation of the coil? So if I rotate the coil faster, what it means is the time it takes, if you move something faster, the time that it takes to do a rotation decreases. So now think of this, if this variable over here decreases, if time decreases, what would happen to EMF? EMF should increase. The reason why? is because these two variables are inversely proportional. As soon as something is equal to something else that is below in the fraction, so like is a denominator in a fraction, then you can tell me that this variable, EMF, and this one here, they're inversely proportional. So your answer would be increases for the last one. Increases. I hope that this has been help helpful. I can't wait to see you in another video. So make sure you subscribe for more maths, physics, and chemistry. Bye, everybody.